Okay, we're ready to start again. Barely have a quorum, but we have one. Uh, no, no. We're, yeah, we heard. Uh, we're ready to, are there other members wishing to offer amendments to the bill? The gentlelady from, can we just deal with the gentleman from Colorado first? Do you want to go to yours first or not? Because we, we can dispense with hers quickly, I'm told. Yeah. Uh, the gentlelady from Colorado is recognized for what purpose? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. She has an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the title. An amendment offered by Ms. DeGette of Colorado. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I reserve the right to object. The gentlelady from North Carolina asks, uh, offers a point of order, and the gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. In Thank you, Mr. Amendment. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, I intend to withdraw this amendment because um, I've been advised that, that the parliamentarians have ruled it non-germane. But, but I want to uh, put it in the record because I want to talk about one of the issues that I've been thinking a lot about with respect to medical malpractice reform, which is um, it's, it's a mystery to me why every few years, like the swallows returning to Capistrano, we take up this bill, but we don't do anything, anything to try to regulate the um, uh, medical malpractice insurance industry. And so what this amendment does is it repeals certain provisions in the McCarran-Ferguson Act which exempts medical malpractice insurers from the federal antitrust laws. Now, I got to tell you, I don't think there's any reason we should exempt the medical malpractice insurance industries from the antitrust laws and federal government oversight. And in fact, in my conversations with physicians and physicians groups, one of the things I find is that there's increasing consolidation of insurance companies at the same time malpractice rates are continuing to go up for these doctors. And so in spite of all of our recent efforts on health care, it, um, it seems that we are just singularly focused on putting the burden for decreasing the cost of medical malpractice insurance on America's patients when really what we should be looking at is the antitrust aspects of the, um, of the insurance industry. And, and there's a lot of other things we need to look at with respect to the insurance industry, too. In past years, I've offered an amendment that would have um, had a study about, about the actuarial uh, processes that insurance companies are using to set the rates for medical malpractice insurance. Because even in states that have passed caps and other types of medical malpractice reform, um, and even where uh, lawsuits have gone down and where average awards have gone down, yet doctors' medical malpractice insurance continues to increase. And I'd like to find out why that's happening and what oversight we can have over the medical malpractice insurance um, uh, companies to, to be able to, to see are these rates actually related in any way to claims or to lawsuits that, that individuals are filing. And so I've got to tell you, if you do not include the insurance industry in any kind of medical malpractice reform bill, you are not going to control insurance costs for doctors. And that's plain and simple. Um, I, I, like everybody, realize that there's a problem that doctors have, and that is that their rates are going up. But if their rates are only going up because of the pricing practices of the insurance companies, then, then that is a problem that we would have. And um, 
I just want to say, what, it, with respect to this particular amendment, why we should repeal the antitrust exemption for health insurers. The Department of Justice's Antitrust Division has acknowledged that abuses could arise from insurance companies' exploitation of this exemption. Christine Varney, DOJ's top antitrust lawyer, said, quote, repealing the McCarran-Ferguson Act would allow competition to have a greater role in reforming health and medical malpractice insurance markets than would otherwise be the case. Um, I was a strong supporter and, and original, one of the original co-sponsors of the Health Insurance Industry Antitrust Enforcement Act, which was, le which was legislation that would bar health insurance insurers and medical malpractice insurance carriers from engaging in price fixing, big bid rig rigging, or market allocations to the detriment of competition and consumers. Provider organizations like the American Dental Association, the American Hospital Association, and the American of Academy of Pediatrics endorse that legislation, and that's because doctors and healthcare providers would also benefit from the increased competition. So why is this amendment not germane? Because this committee apparently does not have jurisdiction over the in, in insurance industry. But I gotta tell you, if we don't do something about the insurance practices that we're seeing, we are never going to uh, bring these malpractice rates for doctors under control. That's only gonna harm the doctors and it's gonna hurt, harm the patients that they're trying to serve. Um, and with that, uh, if anyone else wants to talk to this, I would be happy to yield to them. Otherwise, um, uh, I'll withdraw my amendment. Gentlelady withdraws her amendment. Thank you. Uh, are there other members wishing to offer amendments? The chair will recognize the gentlelady from California. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me just say this. Uh, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the title. An amendment offered by Ms. Eshu of California. And without objection, the amendment is considered as read and the gentlelady is recognized for five minutes in support of her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to start out by saying that um, whether uh, I've agreed or disagreed with uh, what members have said from both sides of the aisle today, I think that, um, uh, that this has really been a, uh, a worthwhile uh, discussion and debate. I especially uh, enjoyed uh, Mr. Terry's uh, 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 presentation. So I, I think really kudos to all the members. They've been really serious-minded and um, uh, uh, when we're talking about the Constitution and states' rights, um, I think it reminds each one of us of uh, how weighty our decisions are here. And on that issue, before I say something brief about this amendment and then yield back, um, I've never really belonged to uh, either school of thought where you're 100 percent a state writer or um, uh, that the federal um, government should um, uh, hold on to uh, and impose its, um, its will across the board. I think that we need to pick and choose what applies and be very particular about what applies where. Um, uh, I'm offering this amendment uh, because it really has to do with uh, patients and consumers. And I think sometimes in a debate like this, especially around constitutional issues, which are very weighty, uh, that, um, that the patients uh, really can be left out of this. Now, when a patient sues uh, for medical malpractice, they often can't afford um, to pay up front uh, for a lawyer. Um, uh, either a full payment or and by the by the hour, uh, attorneys will take these cases on a contingency uh, basis, uh, and that is if the plaintiff wins, then the uh, attorney will receive a percentage of the damages uh, they're awarded, and if the plaintiff loses, then the attorney receives nothing. It's the way uh, the system works today. Um, this legislation specifies that contingency fees, uh, regardless of the number of plaintiffs, uh, cannot exceed 48% of the first 50,000 recovered, 33 and a third percent of the next 50,000 recovered, 25% of the next $500,000 recovered, and 15% of any recovery in excess of $600,000. Uh, I, I think that this provision uh, severely restricts the average American's ability to sue for medical malpractice. 
uh, I, I think it's it's just really highly intrusionary. Uh, uh, the legislation already limits uh, the damages a plaintiff can receive, and I just read them out, uh, to $250,000. Uh, and of course, it goes beyond that by dictating the financial agreement that I just read between a plaintiff and their attorney. I don't know if this is the first time in the history of our country that this would be the law, uh, but I believe it is, and I think that uh, it's harmful. It, uh, I think it will disincentivize uh, any attorneys from taking these cases on, and then where does, where does the average American stand? Where? How? I mean, I, I don't think anyone's really answered that question in the debate today. Uh, and under the contingency fee system, lawyers are paid only if they're successful. Um, uh, so I, I think that what we're doing is building in an incentive uh, for attorneys to only accept uh, what they would consider to be slam dunk cases, uh, where there may be a closer call. Uh, how does um, the um, uh, consumer, the patient, get representation? I think it's unfair to restrict a plaintiff uh, attorney's fees when defendants have no such restrictions. Um, that's a real, creating a real imbalance in our country. And someone said earlier, I don't know if it was on the Republican side or the Democratic side, maybe it was Mr. Engel, that we need to have a delicate balance in what we're trying to do. And I think that this just um, destroys that. I mean, there just won't be any balance, especially if the defendant is a large corporation or insurance company with unlimited amounts of money to pay attorneys by the hour and hire uh, uh, expensive expert witnesses. Uh, the limits on contingency fees would, again, discourage attorneys from accepting cases with lower damages. Why would they do it? I mean, why, why would any attorney take this on? Um, uh, I just don't think that they will. Just like any business decision, medical malpractice cases uh, have to have a built-in system that accounts uh, for risk. And sometimes defendants and their attorneys win, but many times they lose. And when they lose, they get nothing. So I believe, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, that limiting contingency fees is really anti-consumer and that it only serves to further discriminate against uh, those that uh, are victims who can't afford to pay for a trial up front and out of pocket. Um, I also have a larger issue with the bill is that it imposes one system on 50 states, and I don't think that that is um, healthy for the system, and I don't think it respects states, and I really don't think it does anything uh, to um, uh, ultimately uh, 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 to uh, uh, bring down the rates of uh, medical malpractice insurance in our country, which is the, uh, the underlying uh, motivation of the legislation. So um, I thank you and uh, yield back. Gentlemen, ladies, time has expired. Are there other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Gentleman recognized, or chair recognized gentleman from Louisiana. Yes, I can again appreciate the gentlelady's concerns, but the article I quoted later that looked at the, uh, earlier, that looked at the impact of the micro legislation in California upon the rate of lawsuits filed. And it's important to note that in California there is a uh, limitation on contingency fees. This legislation is, ba is based upon that. And in this they find that the per capita incidence of um, malpractice uh, suits being filed has not decreased statistically since 1985, which is when MICRA was found to be constitutional. So one, we can see from empiric evidence that a state which has limitations, it has not limited, has not limited the ability of plaintiffs to file suit. Secondly, there is precedent within uh, the federal court system for limiting contingency fees. The Federal Tort Claims Act limits contingency fees. Next, I'll point out that if you're receiving 15 percent, if someone has a terrible uh, uh, effect and they have uh, very large economic damages, the uh, attorney will receive 15 percent of that very large amount, even if it is, if you will, a billion dollars. So the larger the reward, although the percentage will decrease, the absolute amount will increase. So that will continue to be, uh, apparently, in California, 
an incentive for attorneys to take these cases, there would still be a, a, a reward. Uh, that said, uh, this analysis of the MICRO Act also pointed out that uh, one of the beneficial effects of this was to limit those things of those cases of questionable action, those which before may have been paid off as a nuisance. Uh, now it's not quite so profitable for those nuisance cases to be settled, and that uh, is the first line of savings, if you will, as this case progresses. So if the argument is that it limits the ability of a plaintiff to find a lawyer, that does not appear to be the case empirically, and there's also federal precedent for this. Indeed, that is one of the ways that it saves money. I yield back. Are there other, amendment, other members? Uh, Mr. Pallone. Uh, thank you. I'd yield to the uh, gentlewoman from California. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Uh, I, I just want to, um, and I should add, especially since the gentleman that just spoke talking about California uh, and MICRA, uh, the MICRA law and uh, HR 5, uh, in California the, there is the same, there are the same limitations, but they only apply in medical malpractice cases against a health care provider. In this bill, um, which has the limit, uh, uh, these, uh, these limitations that I read out, uh, but it applies to all health care lawsuits, meaning malpractice and intentional tort cases against doctors, hospitals, nursing homes, pharmaceutical companies, medical device companies, and insurance companies. So they're, they're not one and the same. And I, I think it's important that the uh, record uh, reflect that. And um, I uh, uh, would be happy to yield to Mr. Uh, Waxman, or Mr. Pallone needs to yield. Yield to the chairman, I mean to our ranking member. The, um, as I understand the section that uh, would be struck by the, uh, the amendment, it's a, whole, uh, it's a whole section that gives to the courts the amount that lawyers could earn in each case. And then sets, even with the discretion in the court, certain limitations. In no event shall the total of all contingent fees for representing all claimants in a health care lawsuit exceed the following limits, and it goes through the amount of recovery and then the amount that the lawyers are willing to get. I, I just find that very interesting, that we would micromanage no. uh, the relationship between an attorney and a client to the point of setting that out in, in, and, and then applying it everywhere in the country. Uh, it, it, um, it, 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 it strikes me as, again, a reason why states ought to be handling this kind of matter if they, if they feel there's a problem. Uh, I don't object to the court having the ability to look at it, but then to set a statute that even if a court thought the amount of time and effort by the lawyer required a, great, a greater commitment and, uh, of resources and, uh, and, and time, uh, the, the court then couldn't look at that in deciding the amount the lawyer would be paid. The, um, and it says the limitations in the section apply whether the recovery is by judgment, settlement. You know, I would think that maybe what we ought to also have in there that states uh, always, uh, it always annoys me, is that when you have these collusive agreements between the plaintiff and the defendant, they'll have a settlement, but then they won't let anybody know what happened. <laughs> so they seal the records and people who might be protected by knowing the information can't even get access to it, uh, uh, which could mean that other people will be harmed in the same way. So if we're gonna start micromanaging things, uh, it, it gives me the idea that perhaps we ought to attack that, uh, that issue as well. But I think this is too detailed a micromanagement of this uh, relationship, especially when the lawyer is taking the case on without any payment with the expectation that there could be a contingency. Otherwise, people are not gonna find lawyers. In order to hire a lawyer, doctors don't take it on contingency fee if they're the defendants. They have to pay for the amount of time that was put in by the, by the lawyer. If we required that for any plaintiff, I think we could really hold down the number of claims if that's our objective, but it would be so many people who would not even have access to the courts to get redress for the harm that was done them by the negligence or intentional actions uh, by the uh, defendant. I, 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 I support your amendment. Thank you for yielding to me. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. 
Chairman, yield Thank back. You. Thank you, sir. I, if we could, I'd like to dispense with the amendment before we, we uh, go to the floor to vote. Uh, are there other members wishing to, to speak? Please, sir. If not, uh, the vote will occur on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those in, uh, opposed say no. 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 The no's appear to have it, the uh, no's appear to have it, and therefore the no's have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Uh, I would note that we've got about 10 votes or so on the House floor, so we will adjourn for about an hour and come back five minutes uh, after the last vote.